first off, I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of overall updates and improvements. We even started to introduce um, something we call data wrappers. And they allow you to give sort of more qualified data or additional information to data of various kinds. So for instance, if you use weighted data, you can now compute the mean or any other sort of descriptive statistics. It works in a variety of functions that take data input. And here's the simple case where we can actually give the symbolic solution. Um, Sensor data is when you don't have exact observation, but you have, you might only know a lower bound for your value. Here's an interval from two to infinity, or from minus infinity to three. Um, now again, this works like any data set, you know, for your descriptive statistics and so on. I'll come, come more into this. But I wanted you to see that this, this idea of having data models is something that we're starting to deploy, and you're going to see more of that uh, going forward. Here's an example we'll see more towards the end. There's something called temporal data for collections of time series, basically, and um, it works just like any, any kind of data. That's uh, overall. A lot of things that, that we already introduced um, that we've gone deeper into is, so for instance here, we've had correlation and covariance as an example of a multivariate <coughs> dependency measure. But we've added a whole family of, of additional ones, like Kendall, Tau, Spearman, Rowe, you might know. And then when you get into these, these other ones, you, you may not know them, but they also give, um, uh, give a measure of dependence. There are uh, lots of new tests that go with that for independence and correlation tests, lots of special tests. I'm not going to really sort of show a lot of that. So these are things um, you can see by now there's starting to be a, a kind of a, a, a reasonably large collection of hypothesis tests and so on in Mathematica. Um, another thing on the update side, distributions. So distribution, another name for distribution is model. So these are model libraries. You know, each distribution represents a family of models to use for, for random variables. We've added a lot of new ones, well, not compared to what we did in 8, but we've added new ones as, you know, depending on your requests that have come in and also in areas that we've been expanding Mathematica into. So hyper-exponential, hyper-exponential, and so on. Some of them, you know, can, you can see here what the domain is that they've, they've been driving, driving this. Lots of performance improvements, lots of improvements to everything you saw basically in eight. You know, either they can do more cases, symbolically they can do it faster, and, and so on. Here's a new type of um, distribution, um, which uh, uh, makes it very easy to splice together several distributions. And a typical case that you need to splice together a body of a distribution with a different tail model. So if you have uh, you know, data that you, you understand the bulk of it, but it might, might want a, a heavy tail or something like that. So that's a common thing to do to fit, let's say, a risk distribution or something like that, you know, like default <coughs> risk distribution or something. Um, lots of things for solvers as well. Um, like, for instance, n probability and expectation are in fact using Monte Carlo, can invoke Monte Carlo, which is very good for very high dimensional distributions in particular, and, and so on. All right, so that's something about updates to what you saw in 8. So now let me start in on a few um, kind of bigger areas. So one important um, expansion is, is survival analysis. You found a little bit of that already in 8 in that, um, in that you can use sensor data for one of the non-parametric distributions. So one very important part of that is to be able to handle sensor data, as I said. So sensor data is incomplete data in a way. You don't have exact observation from when some event happens. You might have a, a lower bound, let's say you run a clinical trial and not all your patients die. But you know at that point when you stop having your test, you know, they, they have not yet died. So you have a lower bound, you don't have an upper bound for when the event happens. So, and this, this, this thing of, of having sort of imprecise knowledge of data um, is, is, comes up in, in many contexts. So, the question is, can you still get information, can you get the maximal information out of that anyways? So that's what we've, what, what we've been doing. Okay, so one thing that with sensor data, you can use them just like any other data. So if you want to do descriptive statistics, so for instance, here is a, you can see here, here is a, here's a non-exact observation. You know, I, I know that the upper bound for the observation is six, so that's that, that thing there. 
Here is an, a, a case where the lower bound is seven, so that's that thing there. But I can use it like any other sort of collection of numbers. So I can do mean of it, I can do you know, median, you know, median life or something like that. But I can also estimate non-parametric distributions. So all of the non-parametric distributions just take uh, sensor data or event data just as they take regular data. But not only that, um, if I use that kind of sensor data, I can estimate any kind of parametric distribution. Again, it just works like regular data. So now the estimation procedure will take into account that you have censoring, and that means different likelihood function for these intervals, for instance. And now you can estimate what is the best distribution that comes out of that. So that's one thing. That's an overall system thing. It works across many things. So sensor data is getting to be first class citizens you know, in, in Mathematica. Now, another thing that you want to do, we've added these fit functions that provide a lot of additional information for, for survival analysis. So let's just take a look at, at you know, before I, so I talked about um, sensor data, but let's get an overview of what's in that whole field. Okay, so we talk about event data, everything works with event data. But then there are sort of more specific kinds of models like, um, um, like survival fit where you can get then um, confidence bands for your actual survival curves and so on. And a lot more information, we'll look a little bit into that. But you can also have another kind of model, Cox model, which where your distribution depends on some other variables. Let's say that you had age or sex, you know, you have some other variables that control what kind of, um, of, of survival function that you will get in the end. So these are two, two kinds of important and rich, rich fitting frameworks that provide a lot of additional information. So let's look at one. Often when you see this written, you, 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 people ask for you know, Kaplan-Meier estimators or Nelson-Allen estimators. That's all baked into this. That's just one small part of it. That's, that's a lot more. So let's say, let's do an example. So I have a, a group of 191 boys. We want to figure out when they first used um, this drug. And, um, you know, and there are different kinds of responses. You know, I tried it at HT, I never tried it, I tried it, but I don't remember when. In this last case, I tried it, but uh, when I don't, don't remember when, I, I, don't, I now have an upper bound, right? Because I know when I ask them. So, so we, have, we get some query responses from that, the different formats to, to give sensor data. That's the other thing that we can support, because sensor data are given to you in, in a variety of ways, in spreadsheets and so on. I can now get myself a, a survival model fit, which gives you a survival model, which you can query for a lot of other things. One thing that you can get are these confidence bands. These are pointwise bands. And uh, you can get a full event table. You can talk about sort of how many at risk and so on at different levels. So it, it has some reporting capabilities and uh, lots, of, lots of examples along these lines. Another thing that is actually quite related to, to survival analysis, reliability. So reliability is the, the um, probability that a system is working at some time t. So that time is actually important. Well, a system working, you know, if you think of biological system, that means alive. Okay, so, it's a pro so that sounds like a survival curve. That's what it is. It's just called reliability for technical systems. But it is the same thing. Survival curves, reliability is just the same thing. Um, so there you can imagine that these things are actually related. What makes uh, reliability a little bit different is that we actually look on connected systems. So if you're going to put together a system that, that all have some lifetime that they can break, the question is when the whole system breaks. What is the curve for the whole system? You might not be able to measure it. Imagine that you're building a nuclear power plant. You might not afford to build enough power plants to crash to measure the actual lifetime. Or well, let's say an oil rig, y you know, in which case you want to figure that out beforehand. So that's why we want to, from component reliability, figure out what the reliability is of the whole system without necessarily having to build it. The base idea is, is, is very, very simple though. So we have a lifetime distribution, we call them survival distribution, just, just a minute ago. And, um, so if I'm connecting two systems in series, one after another, 
That means for the system to work, both of them need to work. But the, the lifetime of the whole system is, you know, is going to be the minimum lifetime of either of the systems. So we could do this like this. Really what I'm trying to describe is the minimum lifetime of, of two systems that are connected like so. In this case, it turns out to be a new exponential distribution if I have exponential lifetimes coming in. Well, and this is, this is the survival function or, or reliability function. And, um, and we can see here that, um, that uh, the, the, the lifetime goes down when, you, when I have two dependent systems. But we can work with this like just like anything, right? It's, it's, this is called mean time to failure. A different name for mean in this context is mean, uh, mean time to failure. All right. So this is the stuff we already had in version 8. So what have we added in this version? Now, if you put together, so this, is, this kind of modeling is called reliability block diagram. So I want all of these systems to work. I want it to be a path from start to finish, which means that you know, that system needs to work, that system needs to work, that, that, or that. Because if, if either of them breaks, I can still find a different path. I can express that in a Boolean combination. I need the wheels to work, the engine to work, transmission, and either of the brake systems. All of your cars have double brake loops, by the way. So if one brake loop fails, you still, you know, that's, that's a reliability built into your car. So the way we specify it is, is these systems, and then we just say, for each subsystem, what lifetime distribution do they follow? And each of these systems could themselves be a complicated system. But let's do our previous example that we just did with, with uh, looking at minimum time. So if I want both of these systems to, to, to work, x and y, x, you know, is a, is both of these are exponential, we're going to get the same result as we, as we just got. So and is the same as minimum time in this case. Now I can do the example that we did up here, so I can have wheels, engine, and so on. So here's an example that, that correspond to that diagram up there. And I defined my reliability function for a car. And look at it. Um, I, it's a distribution. So everything that works for distributions in Mathematica, and there's like 35 different properties, different, so, you know, a lot of things all work for even when it's, it's reliability of a system. Particularly, you might be interested in the survival function or the mean time to failure. A different way to model it, so this is a sort of a positive outlook on life. The, the, it's it's success-oriented modeling. Let's, let's flip it around and, and um, have kind of a failure-oriented view on life. So now we ask the question, if this system failed, what could have caused that system to fail? And that can be, you know, one of several things and it can be composite, so I can break that down. It can be one of several things that caused it to fail. Okay? We call that a failure distribution. So the way we give it sort of here are the things that could have caused it to fail. Like in, in this case here, it's either X1, is that subsystem, or, or G1, which is again a subsystem, or G2, and I can sort of continue to break that down. So again, I can give a Boolean condition, and this gives the same this is, in fact, the same elementary example that we started with, where two things need to be true. And so if either X or Y fails, the whole system fails. To zero, you know. And so what we're going to get is, in fact, the same survival function, same mean time to failure. So those are, those are the two common ways, either reliability block diagram, success-oriented, or failure-oriented. And they're completely equivalent. They're, you can transform one into the other. Now, lots of worked examples. Here is a um, um, diesel generator for a nuclear, nuclear power plant. We've done some fairly realistic examples, you know, on the order of a few thousand components that you'll find in, in the documentation there. Um, the other thing, the way it comes in that, that connects to survival analysis is that for each individual component, you might, in fact, have measured it. Let's say it's a pump or something. You're going to run experiments, and you're going to try to measure how long, what the lifetime is of that pump, or the distribution of lifetimes is for that pump. Then you're going to be doing survival analysis. You're going to get sensor data. So you use the survival analysis to get the component reliability. So that's, that's part of how they tie in, tie in together. Lots of examples you guys know of, you know, like a data center. Data centers, we often want to be reliable, so we have a lot of failover capabilities and other things. 
particle accelerator, when the guys at CERN um, crashed their toy, they, um, they started to study up on reliability analysis. So that, that is a, it's a good example because, for instance, each vacuum bulb in that accelerator, you want to have a vacuum pump that's strong enough to maintain the vacuum in neighboring vacuum bulbs in the accelerator, even though, even though sort of one of them fails. So that, that's a, an example how you build in reliability in a, in a coupled system like that. Now, now that mistake cost a billion euros, and often when you, when, you, when you do a mistake like that, you start to deploy these things. So we've, we've had other spectacular things like oil rigs, we're all familiar with, um, and, and so on. And after that, usually people start paying attention. Another reason to, to, to be interested in reliability is for financial reasons. Because if you put out a warranty for a product, it would be good if you can sort of compute beforehand how much it, you expect it to cost you. Or, or maybe you close the company and flee the country or something. But, but you know, you're, you're, um, I was at SunPower, for instance. They make solar panels, 20-year warranties. How will that fare? How, how is that going to pan out? All right, so that's a reliability. Okay, next, the big topic, the really big topic for, um, for version nine is random processes. And, um, and so random processes is, I'm sure you've all encountered some parts of random processes. Maybe some of you have encountered every, every variant of it. Um, it's, um, it's sort of the extension of, you know, random variables are are just that, variables that can take values. Random processes are basically random functions, and they can become a specific deterministic function when you instantiate it. And so this gives us a way to study how things evolve over time, you know, whole paths. So in the random process area, we built a framework that extends and generalizes the framework we built for Mathematica 8 and, and connects to it in a deep way. But we've also added a lot of support for important classes of processes. So Markov chains, discrete time, continuous time. Queues, we'll talk a little bit about each of these. Um, time series um, and differential equations. So time series are basically difference equations, while differential equations are differential equations, both what happens when they get sort of noise, driven by noise input. So these are the most important mechanisms. Um, and there's about 30 processes that we provide out of the gate. Some of them are very general and some of them are a little bit more, more special. Okay, so let's do, let's get sort of set up the framework so we can have a discuss this. So a random variable is a mapping from some event space to, to some domain, you know, typically the real numbers. A random function also takes another argument, an independent argument, time or parameter. And so when we pick a particular event, this becomes a number, you know, in S. When we pick a particular event here, we get a function. So we have something in Mathematica called a random function that will actually simulate the process. So if I, if I pick a, some particular process, I simulate it from 0 to 50, and I will get a temporal data object out. So I'll come back to temporal data. We saw a little bit about it. One important thing that we can see up here that, that this space, you know, in distributions, we have discrete distributions and continuous distributions. Discrete um, takes on a discrete set of possible values, like the binomial distributions, just integer values. And continuous, like normal, can take on all the reals, so it's a continuous range of values. So we can have, we have the same issue here for, for processes, that the value can be discrete or continuous, but also time. You know, the argument to that function can be discrete or continuous. So I'm going to give you some examples in each, each uh, case here. So binomial process, it's discrete time and discrete state. Here's a, here's a trajectory or a path from that. Um, AR process, this is a time series process, autoregressive process. It's discrete time but continuous state. So, and I'm using visualizations that sort of emphasize the discrete nature of time here. Poisson process, but many of you sure have, have encountered, is continuous time, but discrete state. So the possible values, a, a, a Poisson process just counts up. So the possible values are just the integers. So it's discrete state. And here's one of those. And a Wiener process 
um, which is basically integrated uh, independent variables, integrated white noise, is both continuous time and continuous state. Okay, so here I'm getting a random function out of that. And, well, they look different every time because they're random. Um, okay, we can simulate, so the, the, this random function is like random variate, but for processes. So the first argument is a process. I'm saying over what range of time I want to simulate it, and then I can ask for many, many paths. Uh, uh, you know, by default it's just one, but it, we can have a whole ensemble or a whole collection of paths. So this is many, many scenarios simulated under the Wiener process. These are the processes that we're shipping with in Mathematica 9. So discrete time, discrete state, there's a number of them. Discrete Markov chain or discrete Markov process. These are all the time series processes. Here we have um, queuing process and a network of queues. Um, and uh, continuous time and continuous state. A lot of these are, are almost all of them are di stochastic differential equations, basically. And so, okay. So that's, that's sort of um, introduction to processes and being able to simulate them. Now, another thing that we know about processes is, is that, um, so for a distribution or random variable, that, you know, for a particular event, omega, let's say omega one, that becomes a number and that's what you get out when you use random variate. For processes, for a particular value of, of omega one, we saw we get a function and you saw me give that out with random function to give the, the path out, we plotted them. But there's another thing I can do here. I can just fix the time you know, and, and keep, keep uh, the event still sort of, you know, unknown. That, that gives us, you know, so this is now a random variable. That's very interesting. So we, we c for a process, I can say, I want to see what random variable this process is at a certain time. We call that a slice distribution. So if we look at the Poisson process and we slice it at some time t, the distribution that that variable has is a Poisson distribution. Okay, so some of these we can compute in closed form. The slice distribution for normal, for, for a Wiener process is a normal distribution and so on. But now, this is a random variable. That means everything we did in version eight can now be used. We can estimate things, we can generate random numbers, we can plot things, we can, you know, absolutely everything. We can, so here's an example, I, I slice Poisson at one and I treat it as a random variable. So random variate, of course, should work. Here's an example of where I use the Poisson process sliced at T as a distribution. And now I can use probability. What's the probability that that, that variable is less than five? A different notation for that is to just keep the process around and slice it sort of in the variable. That's often how you would see it in a textbook. So here is the more natural way to ask it. What's the probability that x of t is less than five? Well, it comes, you know, that's the probability. I keep a lot of things symbolic here, so it comes out as a formula. So we can do the same with the corresponding data. So let's say I'm generating a thousand paths from a Wiener process. I'm gonna go into all these processes in a minute, but I need to set up the framework. So now I get myself a thousand paths. I can slice the data, that temporal data. That's one of the things it provides you is a way to easily slice the data and get sort of what are, what are the value of all these paths for these thousand, thousand different paths. If I do that, I get a thousand values out. I short it, so didn't particularly want to look at them all. But we can, we can look at that, you know, let's say we can look at sort of histogram of that. You know, it looks somewhat like a normal distribution, as we said, the slices would be from, from, um, from Wiener process. Okay, so let's do this, you know, so here's the slice distribution that I computed from the process. Here's computing it from the data. And if I just put them over each other, you can see that they, they're sort of close. So the, the smooth one here is the theoretical, and the one that looks a little bubbly is the one that came out of simulating it from data. Another way to understand this is if I just look at all the paths, um, 
if I just look at all the paths and I compute the slices that I just talked about, I can plot the overlay the distribution at each point here. Now you can see, and this should just, not a variant of that. Now you can see that sort of the, the, the distribution of values of that path I've just overlaid, you know, what that might look like. Okay, so slice distribution is important because a lot of things that you ask about processes has to do with what's the value at a certain time or will, what's the probability that I'm getting above a certain thing. Now, if we think of these guys as distribution, we can then define other things, you know, like this is, instead of, um, this is a mean function. So this is, this depends on t, and so it's going to be a function that is the mean for each value of t, each value of time is the mean of the, of the random variable. But instead of introducing um, 25 new function that says mean function, median function, standard deviation function, what we do is we use all of our descriptive statistics and you use the slice of your process. So everything the way I have descriptive statistics now works for slices. So this gives you a mean function, median function, and so on. Let's look at an example. So here's a, a Wiener process. The mean function varies with, you know, is proportional to the, to the drift. The mu is called the drift. In this. They have funny names, all the parameters. The median function is the same for that guy. Standard deviation function. Now, I can simulate it. Okay, so let's do, um, in this case, I just compute the mean from all the, the paths for each point. And that's the bubbly curve here that comes from data. And I can use my theoretically computed value for the mean function. And you can see that they, they sort of are somewhat close to each other. They should, should be the same if you have enough data. Same way for standard deviation function. You know, here's the estimated standard deviation function from data. And here's the theoretical one. Now, what does that mean? So if I do a, b a bunch of these, um, I, can, I can look at my, my simulation. That means, in this case, if I go, in this case, I'm going out three standard deviation. So that should be 0.99% of the time my trajectory should be in this shaded region. So you can use it for all kinds of things, to put bounds on things. You typically put confidence bands that are, that are like that. Here's an example where I look at the process value at a certain time. This is the typical financial option. You know, so an option at time t is worth something if the, the value of the, of the asset, the financial asset, is more than 12. So if my stock is higher than 12, all the profit is mine that's above 12. If it's lower than 12, I earn nothing. Okay, so what's my expected value for this, for this, you know, this gain at t? And in this case, I'm keeping a lot of things symbolic. But I'm looking at the Wiener process at time t. And you can just formulate it sort of right away, like, like you think you should. All right. Next up is we can, we can do more than one slice. You know? So if I have all these paths going through, so I looked at putting one slice at t. But what if I take two of them? you know, different points in time, and I want to see how these guys relate to each other. So, because then you get to correlation in time and other things, you know, which is the, the really important thing for, for processes. So we can put any number of slices in and just, just generalize the slice distribution. So here's a Wiener process and I'm taking slice at two points in time. I'm getting a binormal distribution. So that cap captures how things depend over time as well. So let's do an example where we, where we kind of simulate that. Again, this is just a bio, you know, distribution, so everything we did in eight works, you know, like for a distribution. I can compute, I might want to sort of figure out what's the probability that A is less than B, you know, where A is the value of the, that process at time one, and B is the value of the process at time two. I can compute that. Or we can use this other notation that I showed where, I, where you sort of put the slice in your variable. So what's the probability that x of 1 is less than x of 2 when I follow a, a one of these processes? OK. Well, we can do it from data, of course. Um, I simulate that path. I now slice my temporal data at two spots. So I get collections of, of uh, length two lists because, you know, they, they bivariate. 
um, I can look at the, what, that, what does that slice distribution look like theoretically, and what does it look from data? So I'm just estimating a bivariate distribution for my bivariate data instead. And they should be similar. That gives us another thing, which is very important for many processes, covariance functions or correlation functions. So um, the, 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 the absolute correlation function is just the expected value between these two variables. How much are these guys varying together? Okay, and their variance, covariance and correlation and so on, they're just um, normalized and scaled. So here are some examples of, of what these guys look like. And these are things that you can ask for, for any process. These are the, the resulting functions. And this is what it might look like. So if I just go and take a look here. Um, this is um, when, when our time is discrete. You know, two, two discrete time, that's what it might look like. This continuous time is an example that we just look like. So every process has this. You know, and you, often people don't look at more than sort of two slices because then it gets really hard. So most of the things we know about processes are first slice properties and second slice properties, usually called first order and second order. OK. All right, enough of sort of framework. But you, you get the idea how this connects into random variables, right? It's, it's you know, if you think of processes, you take a slice, obviously you get a variable. If you take multi-slice, you get multivariate random variables. And now everything that we did before works for processes. Okay? But then the culture of developing random processes is disparate. It's many different communities that have developed this for different applications. So now the talk is going to change pace a little bit. Because now we're going to talk, you know, it's like what are the Markov guys thinking? What are the queuing guys thinking? What are the, the time series folks thinking? What are the stochastic process folks thinking? It's all relying back to the framework that I just sort of discussed, but I'm now going to talk a little bit more specific. So finite Markov processes, there's a whole set of things. There's two key, key processes, you know, discrete Markov chains and continuous Markov chains. What we've done for many of these areas is that we provided additional functionality because they make the applications that you typically want to do in this area easy to do. So for these groups of things that I'm talking about now, there's sort of additional functionality. OK, so the way you specify a discrete Markov process is, you know, you can think of it as a graph. So here's a picture one. This one has four states, discrete states, and you have to give the probability of transitioning from to each of the other states. If there isn't an arrow, the probability is zero. So state three, which I start in, has a quarter of probability to move over to two, quarter of probability to move over to one, and it can stay in the same with, with probability 0.25, and it can move over to four. Now, you specify that in a big matrix. So state three that we just looked at, you specify that row here. That's the probability. The first one is the probability to go to state one, that one, point, you know, point 0.25 probability to state 2, probability to state 3, and so on. So you give the transition probabilities. OK. Now, of course, um, we can now render that as a graph by just applying graph to it. Um, we can simulate it. Now, this is a random process, you know, so I just defined that process up there. Uh, let's, let's look at some typical, scenar you know, typical ra scenarios from this guy. So I run it. 15 times, and if I keep on running it. So you can see immediately, just from the simulation, that this guy either gets stuck in four, or it seems to oscillate between one and two. Could we have predicted that by just looking at the, at sort of the picture of it, right? I start in this guy, either I'm going to four, and there's no way out. That guy is stuck. It's called an absorbing state. Or I pick either of these, but there's no way back. They're just gonna oscillate between themselves. And that's exactly what we see here when we simulate it, right? So actually a good example, it's my favorite example, I should have done this. But imagine a sort of a frog on a lily pond, it jumping from lily pad to lily pad. Um, and there is a path, you know, you can transition to that lily pad if it's, you know, within the reach of a frog jump. Um, so that, that sets up a, a, a Markov 
chain already there. That what I've said, you know, let's say it's equally likely depending on distance or something. You can then give the probabilities. But you can also illustrate things like the absorbing state because assume at, at one place where there's supposed to be a lily pad, there's a crocodile. Then you can illustrate the sort of the absorbing state and, and other things too. So we looked at what it looks like. Now we've set up the framework. So I can ask for things like, what's the probability that I'm in state one at time 10? Fine, I just ask it. You know, the, the obvious way. What's the probability at infinite time, you know, at long ter uh, for the long-term behavior that I'm in state one? Or really, it should be interpreted, what fraction of time am I going to be in state one? Or I can even keep it symbolic. That's, I wouldn't recommend that for huge markup chains, but for, for, t for toy ones. Um, we also provide, so here's an example of a service function that does something unique to Markov chains. This, in fact, provides a summary table. Everything here that you see can be individually called. So here's the, the input data of various kinds. Um, it can give sort of structural things. The things that I just talked about, absorbing class. These are these absorbing states that you can't get out of. Um, in general, for a Markov chain, it will decompose into groups of states that within each group or class, you can reach every state among themselves. Um, and so that, that defines that, the, the crack. And that's, in fact, what we call communicating classes. So the example we just looked at, those communicating classes are one, two, four, and three. Makes sense, right? So if I look at that picture again, I can go from, from two to, to one and one to two. So those guys can reach each other but these guys, I can't go from here to anything else. So this is one group. And this one, I can never come back. So this is it's one group. So those are the communicating classes. Now, some of them are things that I, you know, once I get into them, I'm going to visit every state infinitely often. And we can see that in this case, too. If I get into this group, I'm going to visit one and two infinitely often with probability one. And if I go to four, I'm for sure going to visit four infinitely often. OK, so you get this kind of breakdown, which is important, particularly for long-term behavior. Um, you can get other things, like um, how, many, how many times are you expected to visit the transient states? So in this case, in our case, it was only state three where we started that was transient. So on average, I expect to, to, be, to, to visit that state 1.33 times. And you wonder how you might do that. But, um, what it means is that it could self-loop, right? So some number of time you're going to self-loop. And so sometimes it will be two or three or something like that. And then the mean number of times is going to be 1.33. There's a number of other things. Let's look at just, I'm just going to, you know, one way to construct these things is to use any graph. So we have a huge connect collection of graphs. And you can build graphs from just about anything, from Facebook and, you know, you, you, you name it. Well. A, gra a graph perfectly well dis defines a, a Markov process. So I can actually give a second argument here, a graph, instead of that matrix that you saw me give. Okay? The way that this one assigns probabilities to the transition is, is say, you're in a state, you can pick any edge that leads out of that with equal probability. It uniformly sort of selects them. Okay? So I can pick any, any graph. Fine. So this is what, the, you know, what that corresponds to. This is, these are the, the knight moving on, if you have a knight moving on a chessboard, you know, it d does these funny moves. So this is a small chessboard, four by four, but it allows me to do the picture nice. And you can see what all the probabilities are, are out, slightly messy. But let's, uh, let's simulate it, okay? And I want to get that there's another thing I can get out of temporal data is sort of the states only, not the time, time and states. But now let's just simulate this guy. We can animate it. So here's where I start. Um, so the red, this is the current state I'm in, and this is where I came from. This is just what I did using highlight graph. And I can jump around, keep on jumping around in the chessboard, OK? And so on. So we can, we, can, we can animate it. We can do these things. But let's pick a bigger chessboard, like a 25 by 25 chessboard. And you know, I can show, so here is a basically a random walk on that graph or that chessboard. So when you simulate the Markov chain, you get a random walk on a graph. And I picked a particular graph, the chessboard, the Knight's Tour chessboard. So lots of things that you can compute, just about anything you want to know about Markov chain. 
um, is, is quite easy to compute. All right, next group. So each one of these is sort of a graduate class, so if it feels like a lot, um, that's why I'm gonna, um, okay, a queue. So one thing, you know, a queue is, uh, we've all experienced queues, you know, and so the, the mathematical model of a queue is really the sort of the line that you wait and then this number of servers that serve you. Um, so that's a single queue. Um, the other variant is that you can have multiple queues that are connected in a network. Like on an airport, you go from check-in to security to boarding and so on. Um, and, and in technical systems like a, a web server or something like that, you fork off to different queues and it gets processed and, and, and so on. So there are many, many natural systems that match queues. This really got developed in the 60s and 70s where this new idea called packet switching that eventually led to something called the internet um, became a popular way of, of doing communication. Right, so let's, sim let's simulate a simple queue here. I'm gonna sort of set, what you need to specify for a queue is how frequently things arrive into the queue, called arrival rate. You need to specify how quickly things get served, called service rate, amazingly enough. So I'm gonna just simulate that queue for a different, num different um, service rates. So one thing that you can see, so this, the, the state of the queue is the number of jobs or people in the system. If I have more people arrive, you know, and I get close to the capacity, the, the rate at which servers can produce things, the, 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 the number of people in the system is going to increase, you know, and you, you tend to get these bulges. If more people arrive than I can service, then you will eventually blow up. Um, but even if you're close. So the, the, the one important thing, you know, the, the, the really important thing you want to get out of a, when you model a queue is what is the expected time that you have to wait in queue? What's the expected size, the queue length? Those are like the two really important things. And you can actually flip the problem around. You can design the system for the, what waiting time or, you know, average queue length and so on you want. So we have, like we had for Markov processes, we have a service function, queuing process, that will actually produce you like a summary report. This are, it, it will tell you about sort of, this one has two service channels. I'm sorry, one service channel. And you can see here, mean system size. I kept things symbolic here, so you can see how it depends on your parameters. But let's, let's see, you know, so we have this, um, you know, there, there are a few other parameters that you can specify for a queue. So one is the number of servers, one is the size. You know, uh, you, if you have a max size for a queue, you reject new customers. You don't let them in the door, you know, if they're new process jobs, you just blow them away. Um, and, a, and a telecom switch does that. You know, when you lift your telephone and you call the switch, if it's overloaded, it will just reject your call. That happens sometimes when there are big accidents and so on, right? Okay, so the first one, is the number of servers. You can see now I have two servers from the same queue, and I'm just showing the summary table of, of waiting times and so on below. Or three servers and so on. That's the number of servers. If I start to, to minimize, you know, or say the maximum jobs or people that can be in the queue, you can see all of these things affect, you know, the actual um, performance of the queue. So that's queues. Everything else works just like processes. I did just a simulation. I didn't look at, at a lot of other things I could have looked. But the most important thing that you want to get out is typically waiting time and queue length and system size. Now, what if we c c connect them together? So here is kind of like a closed. This is, so now I have one queue, one queue. I have three queues, but they're connected in a graph, in a network. So when I exit this queue, I can go either to this queue or that queue with some probability, probability 0.3 or 0.7. So the way I specify it is this one is a closed system, so it doesn't get any new jobs. It's just the same jobs that circulate over and over again. And here are the process rates. These are the service rates for these uh, different queues and initial state and so on. So that's how I can specify a queuing network. Now let's, the, you know, we can simulate it. And here's what we can see that the state is. So here. Um, the blue one here is the, the number of people waiting in the, for the first process. And then uh, red is for the second process, and yellow is for the third process, and so on. Okay, 
So if I, if I just tweak the service rate from that first server, you can see that, that what's going to happen is that you're going to get more balanced state. You know, clearly, the way I first had it, um, if we look at that picture here, everybody's waiting for the first processor to finish its thing. This guy. Okay, so that service rate need to better be faster in order to keep up with these two other ones. So you can see here how I, I, I tweak that service rate and I can see I can get them more balanced to the point where now there's almost no one in the blue queue and everybody's waiting for the other ones. The first one is so damn fast. So that's often what you want to do when you have connected things. You want to balance them. You don't necessarily want one to be super fast compared to the others. You can get the same kind of data. What's this mean si system size? This was where I started. You know, eight jobs, one job, one job. That was an unbalanced. Okay. So you can get a lot of that out for queuing processes. Next up, time series. Many people think of time series as synonymous with, with random processes, which is not all bad. Um, but technically, time series usually means discrete time processes and the kinds of models that people use, I'm sure you recognize moving average, autoregraphy, and so on. They're basically linear difference equations that take white noise, you know, driven by white noise. That, uh, that sounds technical, but that's not so useful. So what's useful is their ability to predict things and, and be sort of general purpose models. So here's a, here's a very simple uh, time series model. It's a first order autoregressive, auto, because it depends on itself. We, all the things that we talked about before, like mean function, covariance function, and so on, we can compute. Even the distribution, it's always normal for these guys because they're driven by white Gaussian noise. We can look at their dependency structure over time. And that's usually what you, you end up looking at for these guys, covariance, uh, you know, the covariance function. One thing that you can see with these guys is that nothing changes over time. They're always the same. You can see what I'm saying? The, the, if you look from this diagonal out, it always kind of looks the same, regardless of which part of the diagonal I'm on. That, that means it's stationary. The, the properties of the process doesn't change over time. And so it's enough that we look out from that diagonal, and that's often how we, we end up plotting them. But let's do an example. So here's some weather data. Um, so we look at, this is the temperature in Champagne from, um, for 14 days hourly, I think. So here's the, the temperature variation for those 14 days. One thing that we can do is to estimate the process. I didn't show that, but absolutely every process we can estimate from data. Given data and a process with parameters, we can estimate what the best parameters are in that process, just as we can do estimated distribution. It's a big feature. I didn't, I did, uh, you know, I should have drilled into that too. It's a kind of a, actually a very big deal. For time series, that's the critical thing. That's one of the most important things that you do. So you're going to estimate, and in this case, I'm, I'm going to estimate a, a seasonal ARMA process, um, very simple process, but the temperature tends to have a 24-hour cycle. It tends to be, you know, so there is a class of models that's particularly set up to track seasonal or periodic things, and that's the S that you add in you know, in the Sarma, Sarima, and so on. And that way, it's going to be, be picking up that, and you really model the rest of the dynamics. Um, what you get out is a fully parameterized model. You can now use it um, to, for instance, produce a forecast. Let's say I want to predict the weather, the temperature, for the next three days on an hourly basis. Um, so here's my weather that I measured. Here's the prediction. And I should have shown sort of correction and how you can adjust it. So estimation, forecasting, simulation, estimation, and forecasting. Those are the three key things for, for time series. And it's sort of a general purpose thing to make, particularly for short-term prediction, it works for a wide variety of things. Last, last topic is stochastic differential equations. So just like, like time series, the stochastic difference equations, these are, that are basically ordinary difference equations, but with white noise input. These are ordinary differential equations, but with white noise input. So we have um, a wide variety of special ones that you might have heard, like Wiener process, Brownian motion. But we also have general ones. You can give your own differential equations. 
So let's just uh, look at a simple example of that. Okay. Um, so, so first of all, some of these these specially named things, like in like a Wiener process, that is actually a a stochastic differential equation, and this means here. mu this notation the mu here means the coefficient in front of that part of your differential equation and the sigma means the coefficient in front of that so a lot of them are in fact uh, differential equations so let's try a simple example here so here's a regular differential equation is x prime equals to x, but then the input is basically white noise. So let's just see what happens when we tune that noise level. So here, if sigma, if I have no noise in, I get the, de the, st the deterministic solution. As I add in more and more noise, we can see how the noise level in the resulting solution also goes up. But ether processes works just like the other processes. So, so we, can, we can pull all the same tricks. Here's the mean function, for instance. Here is the variance function. And now we can, that get enough for us to give confidence bands of solutions. So within these bands, um, which is three sigmas away, should be 99% uh, of my, my trajectories. Um, likewise, we can do slice distributions. Um, like in this case, like the example we just did, this is, in fact, what that distribution looks. Here's the state, here's time. And you can see that it's very concentrated initially. I can't affect the trajectory very much. And then over time, it gets sort of fattens out. That's it. So the first part of, of the talk talked about sort of everything that's gotten better and more and so on. Survival and reliability are basically extensions of that, but more applied. And then the whole last half of the talk focused on, on random processes. And if you remember the framework, I think we've, we've made it work just like um, random variables did for version 8. Thank you. That concludes my talk.